Welcome back to Dave's Gone By, and uh, Dave's got guests, well, a guest, and uh, pretty excited about this one. Um, Went to see, about two weeks ago, an off-Broadway comedy, comedy drama, called Rounding Third by Richard Dresser, who's done a bunch of plays in regional theater and off-Broadway, very talented fellow, and uh, this is one of my favorites of his. It's a cute Really, I mean, people would say commercial or or slick or whatever, what have you, but it's a fun, enjoyable show about two different little league coaches, one of whom is doing it for the first time, and he's not quite intellectual, but kind of nebbishy and kind of, you know, rah-rah and liberal and all for the kids, and the other one, perhaps a little more blue-collar and a little more Steinbrenner-ish in his techniques, and yet neither one is completely right and neither one is completely wrong. We'll tell you more about that, but what really struck me about the play, aside from it being very entertaining, was uh, the performance by the gentleman I happen to have on the phone with me now, a fellow named Robert Clohesse, whom uh, a name you, you probably do recognize, and if you saw the face, you certainly would, because he was a regular on Hill Street Blues, and he's been a regular on Oz, and he's shown up on television all over the place and in movies. Well, if Rounding Third is a hit, and I kind of think it could be, um, I think it's going to be a a next-level performance for Robert Clohesse. He really is fun to watch and, and very magnetic, and he takes this character places that you don't necessarily expect. Anyway, that's enough. Um, just build up. Let's have Robert talk for himself. Robert, thank you so much for being on Dave's Gone By. Hi there. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So, um, actually, just before we were on the phone, you were saying that you spent yesterday evening mostly in misery because... Oh, because I'm a Mets fan. Yeah, I'm, I should say... And can... these last few years, we've been all miserable. You miserable know... Mets fan. <laughs> Highest paid salary and the worst team. I know. Made I the know. worst trades. Nothing ever came through with anything. Well, um, and you know, everybody thought the, you know the previous year would be the rebuilding year, and then they'd start again. But now, now they're at zero, I mean, or they're they're minus three, and then next year will be the rebuilding year. I don't know. You know, Steinbrenner, he, he's the kind of guy you love to hate, but you know what? He gets it done. Well, he's got the whoever he brings over. They 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 uh, they work it. They make it work. They. No, what are you gonna do? It's the Yankees. It's, I, I know it's the curse of the Red Sox, too, but it is the Yankees. Anyway, we're talking baseball, which is really, really appropriate because you're in this new play called Rounding Third, which, as I mentioned, is about Little League coaches. Have you ever done anything like that in, in your well, life? Well, yeah, yeah. I, don't, uh, I didn't play baseball myself, but uh, I played basketball. Like I grew up in New York. I grew up in the Bronx, and I uh, played high school ball at uh, St. Helena's High School. But... Um, I have two sons, 16 and 10, and I've kind of, um, I've actually was more of the other character in real life, as far as baseball was concerned. I was really casual, and, you know, I didn't play baseball, so I was just there for my kids and the whole thing, and I helped out whenever I could. Uh, on the other hand, with basketball, when I coached my son's basketball team, mm-hmm. I was more like the character I played in the show, where I was definitely driving them uh, to to, to be winners, to become, uh, um, you know, whatever, division champions, school champions, and the whole thing. And, and, and I actually did take my son's eighth grade class um, to an undefeated season. All the right. first one they, they never had. They never had an undefeated season at a school, and it was the first time uh, this happened. And, and, and it wasn't totally my uh, coaching. It was just that six or seven players came along at that eighth grade who happened to be, you know, ball players. An interesting thing is, is the one thing that you would expect a play like this to be concerned with is the usual thing of like the crazy parents who are too into the game for for their own reasons and are right. projecting themselves onto their their kids. And you figure that's going to be a big element. And there's a little bit, of, there's one scene in there that alludes to it. But right. you know, this being a two character show, there, there's no way to bring in all these parents. Right. But did you ever experience any of that in your coaching? Uh, I actually did get kind of confronted several times uh, because our team was so good um, that it was hard not to really give a good beat to everybody we played. It just so happened we just would win by 30, 40 points a game. And I would have everybody in there, and I wouldn't press them, and I wouldn't. I would stop fast breaking it. So I didn't actually 
build up the, you know, right. intentionally uh, build up points, you know. But I never that. saw what was wrong with that. I, I know the, the columnist in the Post, Phil Mushnick, has... Uh, I, I've even done a piece on this, uh, that he tends to rant about how wrong it is to run up points on another team. I, right. I mean, if you can score, that's the, the, the object of the game. There's nothing immoral about it. Um, do, you, do you have a problem with leaving all your best guys in there and trying to no, run up No, I would never do that. Why? I didn't do that because, it, it, first of all, if you did start kicking butt, it was an opportunity for the other players to get into the mix with the starting five mm. and and to learn how to play with a team uh, with the you know with say three of the starters and two of the subs come in. So you always wanted to mix it up because we actually only had, only had nine guys on the team. So we um, you know you want to mix it up so you you get different uh, combinations of people working together. So you always keep it uh, moving and fresh and finding new uh, new guys who could play with each other well. Right. And so I never felt um, a desire to really run it up. Uh, you know, there were certain teams, you know, I definitely wanted to kick butt because our school would, would in the past, been their ass kicked from these schools. So <laughs> you enjoy that. But I never, um, I never, you know, threw it in their face. I wouldn't, you know. But actually, the question before was whether you ran into any parents that were really not so. Well, I had ran into parents who didn't like, their their particular team getting their ass kicked, oh, so okay. they confronted me like like you just said. Why did you run up the score? And I said I didn't run up the score. You saw me. I stopped pressing. I didn't fast break the guys. I put in all my substitutions. It's just that we have a bunch of guys who could play. Cool. And so you know, I had to uh, diffuse that, but uh, well, we're, we're, we're getting sensitive about it, but. Yeah, we're, we're talking baseball with Robert Clohesse, but we're going to move now into what really is taking up most of your life, which is performing, which is acting on right. television and, and in the theater now and uh, on film. Let's go back, as people tend to do in interviews, to the beginning. And in your childhood, was there that point when you said, oh, I think I know what I want to do for a living? No, um, no, it didn't. It happened later on. I... Um yeah, we kind of we we grew up in the Bronx, and then we finally moved out of the Bronx when I was a junior, and I went to school junior and senior year in um, up in Rockland County, and uh, a number of different injuries I had kind of snuffed out my uh, you know any uh, dream of playing sports in college, mm-hmm. and um, I was like in the senior play for a goof, and then I oh, what was the play? What was the play? It was called Kismet. Oh, cool! Yeah, a, a musical. Yeah, I was going to ask that question later if you had ever been, because I would not associate you with singing and dancing and tapping. Yeah, well, I actually got my first break in a musical. Which? It was uh, one I did with Blythe Danner. Um, we did it uh, called Lucky Lucy and a Fortune Man, and it was off off Broadway, Lower East Side, and it was a workshop. Mm-hmm. And um, I had worked, I had a small part in a play up at Williamstown Theater Festival with Blythe, and we got to talk, and she liked me a lot, and she asked me to come audition for this workshop, which I did, and, um... I mean, were you, can you sing? Um, I mean, or was it, were you a character well, role? No, I, I, I sung, you know, it wasn't, um, I can sing, but, you know, I don't have, uh, you know, a big musical Broadway voice, right. but, you know, I could carry a tune, and I can, you know... You move well, it. as it were. You know, I could sell it. Yeah. And, um, well, anyway, that workshop got me, uh, an audition for Hill Street Blues, because uh, huh. MTM was producing the workshop. Blythe Danner's husband is Bruce Paltrow, who is the executive producer of, right. of uh, St. Elsewhere. And executive and producer of Gwyneth as exactly. well. Exactly, yeah. and Gwyneth was always around then. And, um, so, and, I got, and I got on Hill Street Blues. Um, so did that Street change Blues. your life? It did. I mean, it got me working. You know, prior to that, I was just doing, you know, off, off, off Broadway, and, you know, you know in little... Dungeons in New York, you know, right. plays, and then that got me onto um, onto TV, and then I stayed out in LA and I did a bunch of TV, a bunch of TV shows and guest spots and all that. The, and um, five years ago, we moved back east because basically I didn't want my kids growing up in LA, and we moved up to uh, uh, Connecticut. Well, LA was dangerous or just boring or for, for living in LA? Yeah, no, I mean, for I just, kids, you know, it's such a show busy town and. And it's it's just um, I wanted the kids to be in in uh, in the country and 
in the woods and and oh, so you fresh air and not, not brown rocking, trees yeah. and smog and right. and talking showbiz. One thing that is in your bio in the playbill is um, you mentioned a, a teacher and director named Walt Whitcover. Right. Um, so at some point you must have studied. Who is this fellow? And, yeah, Walt uh, Whitcover. Um, well, finally, after community college, I transferred to the University of Purchase. Mm-hmm. I studied at Purchase for four years, and he was my teacher, uh, Walt. And then um, he has a, a theater in New York called the Masterworks Laboratory Theater, where he directs all sorts of things, operas, plays, does one-man shows, he has workshops. And so I stayed, uh, studied with him down here, and he directed me in a number of things, and he's always been uh, someone I could go to whenever I have any kind of active problems, and he's a dear friend and a um, you know, real lifesaver, someone, you know, mentor who I could... Um, Looking, looking also at um, your resume, um, rather intriguing that at one point you did play in regional theater Streetcar Named Desire. You were at Hartford Stage in that right. as Stanley. So I guess the question is, how? what was your take on him, and how was it different from you know, Brando and Alec Baldwin? Well, I didn't play that part. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I just Mitch. assumed. No, but actually, Mitch. when I auditioned for that, when I walked in, they thought, um, so you're going to audition for Stanley? And I right. went, no, you know what, I, I'd rather play Mitch. I, I think it's a more interesting part. I mean, uh, this is what I told him. I said, you know, I grew up with a bunch of Stanleys. Uh, mm. I think it'd be more interesting to play Mitch. And so I auditioned for Mitch, and I played. Well, how did you do it differently from Carl Molden? Yeah, well, I really like Carl Molden. And, uh, he was yeah. probably why I wanted to do it. I really like, you know, I love the way he played it and everything. He's great. And, and and forgive me for making that assumption or that mistake, but do you find yourself um, in a certain way typecast? Because you wind up on Hill Street Blues in Oz. Even the character you play in Rounding Third is sort of a you know a Queens kind of mooky sort of dude fella. And do you ever feel like okay, they're going to cast me as that again and again and again and again? A big lug kind of blue color. Yeah. Um. Well, you know, you are what you are. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's uh. You know, I'm a big guy, and, you know, so it's hard, to, you know, especially on TV, you get, you pretty much get cast close to uh, where you are. Though, I, you know, on TV, I've actually had a lot of, uh, an assortment of different roles where I've played, you know, a really mentally challenged, uh, am I allowed to say retard? That you can say. Um, <laughs> on uh, NYPD Blue, I played a... a Painter on Doogie Howser, uh, you know. So I, I've done an assortment of of things, but for the most part, you know, I get cast as the cop or, you know, the bad guy. Right. And um, uh, you know, and if they want to keep doing that and at more frequency, fine with me. As they say, it's a living. Right. That's right. Um, getting back to the particular show you're in, Rounding Third. Um, did the character click immediately for you, or was there a point in the rehearsal process, or maybe previews, where then you said, oh, oh, that's it, I got it. Was there a moment? Well, I was just, I, I think it was a gradual thing. You know, I was trying to figure out, um, mm-hmm. you know, the through line, his whole uh, reason for why he was so motivated to get these kids to be winners. You know, and so I had to find uh, a backstory on him, and I did my own little backstory in order to justify, you know, his fervent uh, right. beliefs and and winning at all costs kind of thing, and 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 that and the desire for that will only help kids in other ways and aspects of their lives that the other character doesn't realize. Yeah, um, um, that is one of the interesting things about both the performance and the character that you know he's you think you have him pegged within the first ten minutes and it's like oh he's going to be he's going to turn out to be all right but he's still going to be like kind of this this butthole and and brash right. and annoying and and then there are moments all the way through where you just go oh wow no he is so much more than that right and and that's the, that I think is pretty special. Um, the show is in an open run at the John Hausman Theater. Uh, I should ask you as we're we're wrapping up. Do you have other projects in the hopper? You, you there's a, a Sydney Lumet film I think. Well, I did a, yeah I did a Sydney Lumet film. Um, 
that should be out. I, I don't know when it's going to be out, but uh, that's with uh, Glenn Close and Oliver Platt. And, cool. And um, Strip Search, I think is the name. Strip Search, exactly. Mm-hmm. And any other projects, or, or right now everything is centered on... on yeah, the... we're sort of doing this play. We're trying to see, where you know, how far, you know, they're trying to, uh, you know, pondering moving it to Broadway, but uh, it's um, it's all kind of up in the air, and, you know, I kind of like not try to think about it and just do my work and get in there and well, stick some butt in the play, and then whatever happens, happens. Well, I have to say it's really good work. I, I really one of the reasons I definitely wanted you on this program was just to say, folks, go see Rounding Third. It's quite enjoyable and fun. And Clo- Robert Clohessy, my guest, is something to watch in that play. So thank you so much for thank being you for us. having me. Have a great day. Thank you. <laughs>